the topic of to fudge or not to fudge has been making its way through the brigade. And it's been quite a persistent topic, interestingly. It's cycled through before. It'll cycle through again. We're not going to really resolve it. We may decide to stop talking about it, but we're not really going to resolve it. Why is that? In my opinion, this is because fudging is based in culture of play around the table. We're not going to be able to resolve it because it's a part of the cultural makeup. It's, it's part of the, the outlook of the gamer. This is not something where a person could interject and say, excuse me, you're doing it wrong. We're not going to find a definitive answer, a definitive solution or correction to a behavior that needs to be modified. Instead, we're going to keep butting our heads against a differing culture. Now, we might choose to embrace new cultures. We might be that kind of gamer. We might not be. We might not be willing to move beyond our cultural bias. Cultural bias exists in every culture. Even the bias to try to not have bias is a bias. <laughs> so we're kind of stuck on that regard. So many of us grew up in an initial culture of play. The, the, you know, the, the core of who we are as a gamer doesn't consider fudging dice rolls to be something we want to do. I'm going to phrase it that way. And we can see problems with it. At the very least, we can create justifications for ourselves not to use it. Likewise, those who grew up with fudging as a part of the Game Master's arsenal can create justifications to use it find it difficult to understand why those from that different culture that is against fudging would deny themselves this tool. Should a game master fudge? I find that is a misleading question. What's wrong with fudging is a misleading question. I think explaining what you use that technique for is helpful. I think explaining from the player's point of view the effect knowing about that technique has on you is useful. I think that discussing how that technique is made a part or not made a part of a particular game is useful. I don't really find much utility in arguing about preference, which is often where the conversation can go. It can go there because often we end up getting insulted or we become tied to a particular point of view that may not be accurate, accurately represented by our detractors or, or those who comment on what we've said or part of what we've said. For example, let's say you're a game master who grew up in a culture of play where fudging was normal, where you never have had to consider it might be a bad technique. This is one of your prized game master skills. Put yourself in that mindset. Role play a little bit. You're a game master who really values the freedom to reject dice rolls, the power of being inspired but not bound to a dice roll, the ability to shape the experience for the people at the table, the responsibility to be able to do that well, the skill of performance it takes to be able to realize you've got a bad die roll, right? to use the terminology from that culture, a bad die roll, something that's going to mess up the session, screw up the game, kill the campaign, whatever. You've never considered that to be a bad technique. And then out of the blue, somebody says that everybody who uses that technique is a liar. 
You've just been called a liar. You thought you were a good game master at 10 seconds ago, and now some joker out there is calling you a liar. It's rather difficult, especially if the idea of being an honorable person or, or you know, not a liar is of particular importance to you. If you, you know, revel in being a liar, then that's not going to matter. People are different. The things that set them off vary. You cannot really expect someone to argue at their best if they're upset that you've called them a liar. They're certainly not going to find it very easy to argue with you who are calling them a liar when all they are is a game master. Like, why are we dragging this ethics into my entertainment kind of stuff? Okay. On the other side, where you're not using a technique, you're actually doing nothing. I mean, either you fudge or you don't. And if you don't, you're not doing anything. So you can imagine how difficult it is to maybe entertain the seriousness of an accusation that you might be responsible for somebody not having fun. I am definitely on one side of this discussion. And for the purpose of this video, that doesn't matter. All I want to do in this video is kind of raise awareness of the influence that our differing perspectives have on our ability to listen and to redirect, much like Nolan Inquisitor tried to do last week, redirect the discussion to the purely technical, which is something we can sink our teeth into and something where we can gain some measure of resolution. That's where I want to focus this discussion technique. What does fudging actually do? What is the function of fudging? We'll also look at the other side, not fudging. So you have one side choosing to use a technique, requires a lot of skill, they can take pride in the in the enjoyment of their players. I mean, it's, it's a long string of positives. It's difficult to accept there might be negatives. It's difficult to accept the negatives that are presented to them by people who don't like the technique. On the other side, you know, as I said, all you're doing is either rejecting a technique or being oblivious to a technique, never even realizing that someone would consider it. Right? Now, let's really broaden fudging out to, to be adjusting a die result or adjusting any other aspect of a scene that's in motion. Okay? We will not be talking about pre-planning. We will be talking about a scene in motion where a game master has to decide instantly if it's going to play out or be altered. Right? Examples of this are um, adjusting the, the health track, of a particular character, of adjusting the number of reinforcements or the timing of reinforcements, this sort of thing. Or out and out rejecting a die roll or modifying the effect of that die roll in some way, not letting it lie. Okay, that's what we're going to call fudging for the purpose of this video. The other culture of play doesn't do this. They're motivation on that side is usually drawn from the point of view that the story will be emergent. They're not following a script. They're not following a hoped for arc. They're making decisions. The focus is on the decisions. That's why there's this culture clash. Right? Fudging removes the point to me making decisions. So, we've got fudging and no fudging. Okay. What are the benefits? In discussing the benefits of fudging, as defined, I run the risk of sounding like I am hiding criticism in a compliment. So please keep in mind, as I list off the things I see as the benefits of fudging, that I'm seeing them as benefits. 
Okay? This is what the technique allows you to do. I'm not judging it. I'm describing it. If it sounds like I'm judging it, I hope that's not the case. And it may be a case of listener bias intruding on what I'm actually saying. Projection of a, a reaction to what I'm saying. So let's both try to keep an open mind. <laughs> so benefits of fudging. The primary benefit that I see beyond what normally gets gets talked about is that it, main, it allows a game master to maintain control over gameplay regardless of how much, let's say, system mastery they may have. They may be an extremely old hand who understands every nuance of the system. And what fudging allows them to do is to tell stories. Telling stories, as I've just stated it there, means to have narrative control over where the story is going. The story is not emergent. It's being shaped by the will of, in this case, the game master, because they are fudging the results. Okay, so they are shaping a story. They are, they are creating a story around the players, and the players are operating within that story, which is slowly being, let's say, revealed. Okay. Fudging definitely allows you to do that with panache. And the more skill you have in performance, the more skill you have at juggling the variables in your head, the better that experience is going to be. You will be better able to emulate fiction, film, books, that sort of thing. You'll be better able to follow narrative beats. You'll be better able to move through the standard story structure. That's what fudging allows. If you have a particularly sensitive player in your group who is not going to react well to certain things, maybe a novice player, maybe a very young player, or you know someone who has this aspect to their personal character that makes some outcomes not desirable, being willing to to fudge, to reinterpret, to reevaluate, to misdirect away from what the system is telling. Being able to do that allows you to maintain control and give them a better experience. So that's what I see as the value of this technique of fudging. Not doing it. We're kind of in a weird position now where we need to describe the benefits of, of not doing something, of a non-technique. What are the benefits of not choosing to fudge? I'll save some of the things that I think personally are benefits for later, but more generally applicable benefits are that the players... because of the feedback they get from the system, from your, uh, from your rulings, from your arbitration, will become better at making decisions that fit the game that you're playing. They have to. If they don't, they will suffer the negative consequences. The negative feedback will show them what they can and, and cannot get away with. You know, if you're running a, a particular genre. Right? The, the game, if allowed to play out the way that it's built, will help ground the players in that genre so that their characters become more natural parts of it. A game like RuneQuest will punish players who want to treat it like a game of Dungeons and Dragons. Right? The two systems produce very different outcomes. Right? And 
it's not that one is more lethal than the other. It's just the tactics, techniques, mind space of one is not the tactics, techniques, and mind space of the other. If I have a bunch of players from one and I thrust them into the other, they're going to encounter friction with the system, which may be enjoyable for some as a learning mechanism and may not be for others. And so the fudger will actually deny them the learning experience by smoothing out those rough edges. Right? Sure, the session might be more fun for the intervention. The character doesn't come or the player doesn't come away having learned anything, and that forces you into this downward spiral of regularly needing to fudge. This brings us to the second. If you don't do it, you will find you don't have to do it. Becoming conversant with your system, learning to understand your players, working with players so that you all become, you know, let's say, collaborators with the system to discover a story. It means you don't find yourself in the situation where you're pushed into a corner of having to reject a die result or to change the statistics of an existing character or uh, alter uh, a timeline that has been in motion, that sort of thing. You simply don't have to. And I see that as a, as a benefit. A personal benefit for me, I like playing a lot of different systems, and I, I like to get into them as deeply as I can, given the amount of time I have uh, to, to devote to that particular game. Anything which helps me see the game for what it is and experience what the, the game's contribution is, the system's contribution to my game is is valuable to me. If I allow myself to interject and and void die results I don't like or or adjust upward or downward the the stats of any particular creature, I, I don't actually get to see that in action. The last benefit is surprise, and we've talked about this a lot uh, on this channel and and a few others and people who uh, cite an interest in uh, simulationism or in the emergent properties of story. This is one of the things that we cite a lot, being surprised. If I'm actively engaged in making changes, making additions, rejecting dice results, I deprive myself of that surprise, and it's very valuable to me. So the benefit is I get to keep being surprised. Sure, on both sides. You can always be surprised by something that a player wants to do. But if you don't engage in, in fudging, you can be surprised by so much more, positively and negatively. But from the, the standpoint of someone who wants to discover a story, there are no bad roles. There's nothing that needs to be fixed. The primary impetus as I see it to engage in fudging is to produce a more enjoyable story-based experience around the table. It de-emphasizes player choice and emphasizes artistic control over the flow of the story coming from play. Not fudging emphasizes the importance or it validates the importance of player decision. It gives a higher degree of, of risk versus reward. It coaxes both players and game masters to develop more system mastery. This part of the video may be seen by some as controversial or stirring something up, being confrontational. That's not my intent, it's just an example. Let's take something extremely simple, such as generating the attributes for a basic Dungeons & Dragons character. This is the classic roll 3d6 in order. Okay, so here's my example. Group sitting around the table, they're going to be rolling up characters for their experience playing basic Dungeons & Dragons. And one guy says, I'm going to play a wizard, and grabs up the dice and rolls them and everyone's watching to make sure that there's no you know, uh, 
cheating going on. And they watch as the guy rolls the traits. And they are fantastic traits for farmer, or gardener, something like that. Nothing that's going to make playing a wizard exciting. In fact, it will actually make playing a wizard very, very hard. So, what do we do? Do we keep that character, but the guy doesn't play it, and he tries again, and he tries again, and he tries again, until he gets something that's closer to the idea of a wizard? Or do they switch from the idea of roll straight down the line to roll and assigned. They start moving some of those mediocre traits around to kind of approximate a wizard. Or do they say to themselves, you know, next time we're going to do something different. And that might be point by, or it might be roll 46 and drop some number or other and that kind of stuff. This is my example. Somewhere along the way in here, a mistake was made. A mistake that not a lot of people recognize. What was it? The mistake was made in framing the original roles. The person who was rolling started out by saying, I'm going to make a wizard. See, they had a character concept already, but the role that was used, rolling 3d6 and allowing them to appear in order, this has nothing to do with fulfilling a character concept. It has everything to do with discovering a character concept. You roll the dice, and then you start thinking, who is this person? You can't approach it saying, I'm going to roll a wizard, because you end up at odds with the dice. Knowing how to frame a roll properly means you don't wind up at odds with the dice, which ultimately means you don't need to fudge. You don't need to do something which changes the outcomes. Understanding the system, understanding your players, paying attention to the reaction to this kind of example enables you to create new methodology or new approaches so that the next time you get a better result. The value is in knowing the effect of the techniques, the function of the techniques. The value is not in choosing one type of culture over another. Framing roles properly is not the golden ticket out of this particular ongoing, never-ending discussion. But it's something that can arise next, which we can all benefit from. Like choosing to fudge or not fudge, how a role is framed is as susceptible to culture as anything else. We're not going to agree on how a role should properly be framed or what does and does not merit giving uh, a role a pass, you know, waiving a role, that sort of thing. We're not going to agree on those things. We're not going to agree on the idea of, of uh, challenge ratings or, or threat assessment or properly balancing an encounter so that a specific kind of effect will be wrought, you know, wearing down the PCs, delaying the PCs, giving them a fun romp, mowing through minions, whatever. We're not going to agree on those things, but we can discuss how, when, why to do those things, and we can all learn from them, and that will be fantastic, and it will grow out of other technical discussions. It will grow into other technical discussions, and we can kind of bypass these weaker conversations that are rooted solely in preference and, and, and culture and just alienate and isolate people for liking or not liking something. Thanks for listening to all of this.